Hi friends, uh, this is Dr. Vivek Goel and uh, today's video is about COVID-19, the current pandemic that we are all experiencing. Well, many of you uh, know quite a bit about it, but I see a lot of misinformation circulating. So I thought, why not discuss the disease in a nutshell? The etiology that is a virus, its, its nomenclature, its properties, the disease it causes, the clinical manifestations, how to diagnose it and how to treat it. So what's in the name of virus? You might have heard quite a few names. But what is the rationale and the science behind each terminology? In December 2019, it was first identified in the Wuhan city of China. So it was called as the Wuhan virus or some people even called it Chinese virus. On 11th of January 2020, it was known as the novel coronavirus 2019. Novel because it was previously unidentified in humans. On 12th of February 2020, the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Virus, that is the ICTV, called it SARS-CoV-2. What does it stand for? SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. It was named so because of its relationship to the original SARS coronavirus which caused an outbreak in 2002-2003. Let us decode this virus. The COVID-19 or the SARS coronavirus 2 virus is a beta coronavirus which is an enveloped positive sense RNA virus. It belongs to the subfamily of orthocoronoviridae which further belongs to the family of coronoviridae. The other known two beta coronaviruses are SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus, which led to severe and fatal outbreaks of respiratory tract infections. The MERS coronavirus, that is a Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, it caused an outbreak in 2012 originating from the Saudi Arabia. Whereas the SARS coronavirus, known as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, caused an outbreak in 2003 which began from China itself and later on spread to Hong Kong, Canada and the rest of the world. Whereas now we are battling this virus that is the SARS coronavirus 2 which has caused this pandemic in 2019 and further on. So what's in the name of the disease? The disease as we all know is known as COVID-19. But where does this word come from? The first four letters, that is C-O-V-I, comes from the word coronavirus. C-O comes from corona and V-I comes from virus. The letter D comes from disease. And 19 represents 2019, the year when the virus was first isolated. Now, what is the structure and the role of each protein in the virus? Namely, the important proteins that this virus has are the spike protein through which it attaches to the host receptor and internalizes in the host cell. You have the M protein or the transmembrane protein through which it transports the nutrients, causes the bud release and formation of the envelope. You have the nucleocapsid protein which basically protects the RNA of the virus. You have the envelope protein on the outside and in the inside you have the single stranded RNA through which it multiplies and divides in the host cell. There are also 16 non-structural proteins inside the virus, the exact function of which is yet to be understood. Now, how does the virus transmit from one person to the other? It mainly is transmitted through respiratory droplets. When you cough, when you sneeze, when you talk, you basically exude respiratory secretions and if a person comes in contact with those secretions and directly touches his eyes, nose, mouth or ears, the virus can gain an entry into the ecosystem of another person. If you happen to touch a contaminated surface which has the virus in the form of a fomite and again if you touch with that hand your own eyes or nose or mouth, you might again have the virus. But the droplets do not travel more than 6 feet, that is about 2 meters. That is why a social distancing of six feet is always of six feet is always advised. Because if you stand away from a person with this distance, 
you are very less likely to contract the virus. Now, this virus has also been isolated in the stool, semen and the blood of COVID positive patients. But none of them have been yet found to be significant sources of infection. So respiratory transmission still continues to be the most fatal and the only way this virus is transmitted from one person to the other. Now moving on, the stages and the clinical features of this disease. This viral disease progresses to three important stages. The early infective stage, the pulmonary phase and the hyperinflammation phase. The early infective and the pulmonary phase, that is the, half, that is the first half of it, is dominated by the viral response. Whereas the second half of the pulmonary phase and the hyperinflammation phase is basically dominated by the host inflammatory response. Now, the early infective phase that lasts for about the first four to five days might be asymptomatic. This is where the virus is multiplying inside the host cell. The person might be asymptomatic or he might have mild constitutional symptoms like headache or fatigue. He may even have a low to moderate grade fever. If you investigate this patient, you might find non-specific viral signs like lymphopenia or maybe an increased prothrombin time or derangement of D-dimer and LDH because this disease also predisposes to thromboembolic phenomena. Now, coming to the pulmonary phase, this is where the virus starts messing up with the patient. Here is where the patient mostly comes to a healthcare facility because he feels short of breath. There is dyspnea and if you check his saturation with a pulse oximeter, you might find it to be low. That is, there is hypoxia. If you do a chest imaging, you can find abnormal chest imaging. Now, it progresses to the last and the final stage which is the hyperinflammation stage. As the name implies, this is basically a cytokine storm. There is rise in levels of interleukin-6, C-reactive protein, tumor necrosis factor alpha, where the, where the host's immune, immunity is trying to fight the viral response. And it creates an inflammatory cascade and a lot of tissue damage. This is where the patient develops multi-organ dysfunction mostly in the form of acute respiratory distress syndrome or maybe myocarditis or even shock and ultimately the patient succumbs if at all he does so. Now coming to the symptoms of COVID-19 infection, I have already described most of it. Now a patient can be asymptomatic. This is very important to understand and studies have shown a range of ranging from 18 to 50 percent of asymptomatic COVID positive patients. Now coming to symptomatic, fever is the most common symptom of a COVID-19 patient. The other common symptoms in order of importance are dry cough, fatigue, there could even be sputum production, there could be dyspnea or shortness of breath, there could be non-specific myalgia or muscle pain, there could be sore throat, headache, nasal congestion, diarrhea. Now as we see, more and more COVID patients, more unusual presentations of this infection are being expressed out. We have seen patients of isolated anosmia, that is loss of the loss of the sense of smell, presenting as COVID. We've seen strokes. We've seen increased thromboembolic phenomena presenting as COVID. Now, being a nephrologist, what also intrigues me is that the that the renal manifestation of COVID-19. The most common renal manifestations of COVID-19 have been proteinuria, hematuria and acute kidney injury. So it ha can have a wide array of symptoms ranging from asymptomatic on one side of the spectrum to acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is the most common cause of death in this patient. But the good news being that the case fatality rate is only 2 to 3 percent. That is only 2 to 3 patients out of every 100 will succumb to the disease. So, who are more likely to have a severe disease? It is the adults with advanced age, that is the elderly population, mostly above 60 years of age, or those 
who have underlying comorbid medical conditions like cardiovascular disease, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, chronic lung disease, cancer, chronic kidney disease, and obesity with a body mass index of more than equal to 30. Diagnosis. So how do we diagnose this condition? The World Health Organization recommends for specimen collection that we take a nasopharyngeal or an oropharyngeal swab from the upper respiratory tract. The lower respiratory tract can also be used to take a sample such as sputum, endotracheal aspirate or a bronchoalveolar lavage which is usually done if a patient is unable to give the above samples. In the laboratory from the above samples, we carry out an RT-PCR and we amplify the genetic material that we have extracted in the sample. If the test is positive, we should check it. We should repeat it once more to confirm the diagnosis. Now, antibody-based testing is also the new thing which has come up, the kits of which have already starting to be available in our country as well. How do we treat this disease? At the outset, let me tell you, no definitive treatment of COVID-19 has been found yet. The treatment, like any other viral disease, is mostly conservative. What do you mean by conservative? You maintain good hydration, maintain good nutritional support, that is increase the protein intake. If you have fever, you can take a paracetamol. If the patient develops respiratory distress, give him support in the form of oxygen therapy. If that does not suffice, you can add a non-invasive ventilation. But if the, if the dyspnea and the hypoxia worsens, you might as well have to endotracheally intubate the patient and put him on a mechanical ventilator. The main thing lies that we have to stop the transmission of COVID-19 from one patient to the other. So, the positive patients must be maintained in strict isolation. They must have an N95 fitted respirator and protective clothing for all the persons who are looking after the patient, including the doctor, the nurses, the staff and all the caregivers so that no one should contract this highly infectious disease. Specific therapy. The point where the entire world has been running after. At the outset, I've already told you there is no effective antiviral specific therapy for COVID-19 which is available yet. A lot of trials have already been conducted and are being conducted. The NEGM study showed no mortality benefit of the initially promised lopinavir ritonavir combination. Hydroxychloroquine has been recommended by the National Task Force by the ICMR for prophylaxis of this infection for selected individuals like the asymptomatic healthcare workers who are seeing confirmed cases of COVID-19 that too at a dosage of 400 mg twice a day on day 1 followed by 400 mg once a week for the next 7 weeks. Initially, hydroxychloroquine was popularized by the US President to have been the breakthrough treatment of COVID-19 but a lot many studies and articles have clearly shown that it does not have a statistically significant role in the treatment of COVID-19 yet. So our management still continues to be primarily conservative. Now what are the potential therapies? Is there a silver lining yet to be discovered? Maybe. All the potential therapies, they aim to target one or the other portion in the life cycle of the virus. So that if you can inhibit the viral multiplication in the host, you can nip it in the bud. For example, the camo state misylate, it inhibits the TMPRS2 and thus prevents the viral entry inside the cell. Next, the membrane fuses and gets endocytosed, which is inhibited by the arbidol, which targets the H2 protein and the chloroquine and the hydroxychloroquine, which was initially said to be very promising, which creates an alkaline environment inside the cell and thus inhibiting viral replication. The lopinavir-dironavir, it inhibits 
the polypeptide conversion to non structural protein by the process of proteolysis the remdesivir which is currently said to be the most promising drug or the ribavirin and the favirapir it inhibits the rna dependent rna polymerase the process by which the single stranded rna of the virus multiplies into another and thus could inhibit the viral replication so these are the potential therapies that we still have in our closet but the benefit of any one of them is yet to be established so what do we have is it all gloomy not so my friends the be the best armor against this virus lies in the mode of prevention the age old saying prevention is better than cure has turned out to be the most and the bestest thing in this time of pandemic so how do we prevent it the basic thing lies in washing our hands thoroughly again and again not repeatedly touching our face wearing masks maintaining social distancing hand washing again and again if you have any symptoms in the form of fever cough breathlessness immediately contact your doctor and very importantly see what is not in our hands cannot be controlled but what is in our hands in our hands we have our own immune system so please boost your immunity how do you do that please do not smoke do not drink maintain a good hydration take a good nutritious diet full of antioxidants full of vitamins take a lot of fruits if you do so even though you might contract this virus it is very less likely the case fatality rate being so low that you will ultimately emerge victorious with this i thank all of you for patiently listening to me uh, my facebook page goes by the name of love for medicine and my youtube channel is dr vivek goel nephrology please do follow it do not forget to like share and subscribe and do press the bell button please leave your comments below tell me how did you like the video give your valuable feedback and also tell me any relevant medical topic you want me to create a video on i shall be the most happy to do so thank you very much